Hello everyone, I believe we should be live at this point. Please leave me a one in the chat to let me know that we're streaming. But I'm here with Thunderous One and today's subject is Islam in Europe. Uh, so hello Thunderous, welcome, good to be with you again. Uh, hi everybody and hi to you as well, Lloyd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone says you're their favorite, um, you know. <laughs> Everyone says we're a great team except for me, so uh, I guess I guess that means you're the you're the uh, popular one here. No, it's not true, Lloyd. It's a team effort. Yeah, that's just yeah. So so how was your uh, day in London? Uh, I saw a video recently on on the news about a march in London with hundreds of burqa black burqa clad women, and it was disturbing to see these people not embracing English culture, but asserting their own, carrying Saudi flags, the black flag of jihad. It was disturbing. You there, Thunderous? Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I've lived with that, though. I live I live in this country, and I've pretty much been watching that um, ongoing. I, th I was going to I probably mention, for me, one moment in history where Islam, in effect, became empowered or emboldened to be more like this and assert its um, authoritative attitude. Um, and they're not into um, being um, integrated. What they seem to be gunning for is um, assimilating the other indigenous populations into their own culture and law. Yeah. Um, and that yeah. seems to be pretty much going on effectively at the moment. Yeah, true. You know, let's just stop and say, say hello to everyone for a moment. I see we've got Neil D. Welcome. XYZ, always good to have you. Thank you. Uh, then we've got BBB, channel is growing. Yes, uh, 14,100 now, heading to 15,000 and hopefully to 50,000. But let, let's see how that goes. Um, then I have Peter Foley, welcome. Eric Braun, uh, Kush XD, Peridot. Hello there. How are you doing? Why does YouTube sometimes put names and then other times it puts like the, the handle? It's, it's so strange. Francisco L, welcome. And uh, yeah, it's snowing in Poland, it's snowing in Europe because of global warming, it's freezing, it's less than zero degrees Celsius, which is obviously a sign of the, the new freezing heat that is developing because of global warming. So the heat becomes freezing and it, the freezing burns you and, and that's science. Right, right Thunderous? Very much so. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So I was, I was just looking. I was just looking at a question that Neil D has posed into the chat. What does the V stand for? And I'd just like to address that, if I may. Sure. What was the question? Um, uh, what does the V stand for? So that's obviously with reference okay. to my thunderous one, um, ah, okay. tag. Uh, yeah, the, 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 there was a book written in the 1950s. It couldn't happen here, and it was a reference to the fascist takeover of um, America. That was later adopted in the 80s by Joseph Conlon into um, a science fiction miniseries called V. Uh, and then the, yeah. the second series was V, the final battle. Um, and it talks about a resistance fighters basically fighting against um, a fascist takeover of Earth. Um, the reason why I've adopted it is one, because I was absolutely fascinated with the science fiction when it came out, it had an influence on my mind. Um, in um, the 80s when I first saw it. And um, 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 the, the V is not so much the, set, the the new latest version, it's the 80s. Yeah, I remember uh, the 80s version. <laughs> I remember it. Mark Singer. So the, there it's like you're fighting an ideology uh, from, a, from the biblical narrative. You're fighting against a system that seems to have succumbed to a fascist takeover um, in many guises with Darwin or atheism and Islam. So the V is kind of like symbolic of my resistance against that. So yeah. that's why I use the V. Yeah, I think I'm sharing my screen with you, right, Thunder, so you can see what I'm yeah, showing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I'm also using ultra low refresh rate. Yes, this is where they ate the rats. That's exactly the one where they ate the rats. So Eric Braun, welcome. Yeah. And Nitish, welcome. I look like actor Michael Keaton. <laughs> that's awesome. <Yeah>. I'm Batman. <laughs> right. Michael, welcome in Dresden, Liam. Very welcome. Yeah, so hold on, I've got the V series. Let me just take that away. Uh, so those of us who were sort of raised up, raised in the eighties, we all remember this. You know, the, the spaceships, and uh, yeah, those of us will remember. Um, yeah, these scenes. These scenes <laughs> should be familiar. Yeah. 
And, and I think as well, when you watch the TV, TV series, it's not so much the science fiction side of it, it's a social narrative as well, where it shows that some people just don't care what's going on. Some people willingly go along knowing that they're working or colluding along with the enemy. And we live in a world pretty much like that, where people are... Jesus said um, in Matthew 24, 36, speaking of Noah's flood, or when he was referencing Noah's flood, he said, um, just as the days of Noah were, so the presence of the Son of Man will be. For as they were in those days, eating and drinking, men marrying and women being given in marriage, and they took no notice until the flood came and swept them all away, so the presence of the Son of Man will be. In effect, what Jesus was saying is that uh, Matthew 24 deals with the prophecies of the last days, the, the world events like the earthquakes, the wars and the pestilences and such. But for many people, it's business as usual. They don't see the significance of the connection of the prophecies and world events as they are today. And it's business as usual, and they go along with their lives. And that's very much, you know, what, what was being said in this science fiction series, that people, would they, they see what's going on, but they're oblivious to it. And then there are another um, side of the narrative where people are willingly going along with the badness for whatever personal gain that they can get. And we see that today to a certain extent um, that's complicit with the media in a way that uh, we're watching things unfold um, in the world. But the media seems to be complicit with the events and rather than attacking the ideologies or the people that are committing these atrocities, they seem to be speaking in defence of the atrocities and maligning those who stand up against um, those who expose, say, for, um, the, how can I put this? When a Muslim attacks or kills someone, like somebody murdered somebody in um, France yesterday, they call him a Muslim extremist. Yes. They don't, seem to, they don't seem to want to identify anything extreme by the ideology. It's the ideology that's extreme. The guy who's just done the murder, he's not an extremist. He's just following the ideology. It's the ideology that's extreme. And yes. it, it can't he's be actually following people. Islam strictly, correctly, fully. Exactly, exactly, exactly the point. So they're not fundamentalists or anything or extremists. They are Muslims. The only extremist Muslims that I perceive when you go through the Quran and uh, life experience are peaceful Muslims. They are the extremists. They're extremely peaceful which is against the Islamic um, um, manifesto. I mean, well, what is the punishment for hypocrites in Islam, uh, Lloyd? I think they would be lashed. They're lashed, but also they have the same ending if they continue with their um, hypocrisy as the unbelievers. They'll suffer torment in hell. So, Right. Yes, yes, of course. So, of course, see, so the, the, so when you really analyze intellectually, when you go by the Islamic um, manifesto, the hypocrites, or what we would say the peaceful Muslims, are actually disgusting in Muhammad's eyes and Allah's eyes, and they would be receiving the punishment in, in hell. They are the extremists, but the ones who follow what the Quran says by killing um, the kuffar and um, creating the mayhem and the disruption in whatever land that they manifest themselves in, they are the ones doing exactly what Allah and their, their Muhammad wanted them to do. So they are the real Muslims. They are the pure Muslims. They are not the extremists. These are the ones that are referred to as martyrs, these are the ones that will go receive Allah's brothel yeah. or go to Allah's heaven. Can I just mention something for the audience? So this, this term is rukhsa, permission or dispensation. So Islam, remember Islam is not a moral system. It is a legal system. It doesn't have, it doesn't have morals. It has laws and it doesn't have right and wrong. It has legal and illegal, right? So this, Rukhsa is a relaxation or suspension by way of exception, an injunction of a primary and general nature. So in other words, it's a suspension of the law. So most Muslims are operating under a suspension of the law, operating under Rukhsa. They are not strictly following the law. That is required by a small minority at all times, though. Those are your, what you call your extremists. So the counterpart of this is Azima. So let me go look up. Let me go and try and find Azima. Um, the search function doesn't always work 100%. So let me just find that. Why is it? Here we go. Azima. Determination, resolution, fixed purpose. In religious law, Azima is an ordinance interpreted strictly, the opposite of Rosa, 
which is an exemption or dispensation. In magic, azima is an adjuration or the application of a formula of which magical effects are expected. So it is a form of magic. So in other words, this intention also means magic. This is a really odd um, secondary meaning of the term azima. So strict adherence to Islam means also following a magical formula. Isn't that a little odd, Thunderous? Well, considering that uh, Muslims like to quote Deuteronomy 18, 18, it's a shame that they don't read Deuteronomy 9, 10, 11, and 12 first. Uh, someone asks, can them. people take the law into their own hands? Um, that's Neil D. Yes, yes, they can. Yes, they can. Um, I've covered that extensively, but yes, that is possible. So this will be banned under the Mosaic Law. So it's interesting that they go to a source of the Bible to, to promote their prophet, which the very same chapter condemns the law that they are subscribed to. But can I just ask a question on this yeah. then? But in order to, to um, if you go to the first part, the Ruksha that you mentioned, can you just bring yeah. that up again for a moment? Uh, let me do, let me just find it. So that's Azima and... Here we go. It's up. Right, Ruksha. So it says there, um, well, you've just, just gone up again. By Ruksha. A Sorry. Just a second. Yeah. So it's suspending by way of exemption under certain circumstances. But that exemption or uh, suspending can only be administered if you're aware that you're under the exemption of the suspension, correct? So the hypocrites as they are today in the Western world, living their lives, being peaceful, they are not aware that they are living under a suspended or an exemption, are they? Their, their, their peacefulness is an oblivion from or oblivious understanding of what their law requires of them, correct? So BBB makes a point here. So active versus paused or sleeping until called upon to be active. So yes, that, that is one very likely potential um, use case or case of this. However, what happens is, generally speaking, you have a few Muslims in an area until they reach a certain critical mass where there's enough of them to financially sponsor a mosque. And then what happens is you have Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and others fighting over who's going to put their mosque up and who's, you know, which, which group is going to put up the mosque and put the imam in there. And then what happens is that imam, once he sees there's enough people, he starts saying, okay, guys, you've been playing around long enough. Now it's time to follow the rule book. And he starts to implement the Sharia slowly but surely, step by step. And then they get made aware. And then he will pick people within the group who he thinks are going to be ones who can follow Islam strictly. And they become the, the true followers of Islam. Mm, making them proselyte. Yeah. Um, just so, by the way, so this is actually a photo from yesterday. This, this is a jet. Thing. Is this Dusseldorf, Germany? Um, Munich. So this jet is like frozen to the runway and it's like tilted over from the weight of ice and its engines or whatever it was. Um, yeah, global warming. Global warming causes that. Um, and yeah. Yeah, just just on something that um, BBB mentions is Azima Ruksha or uh, active or pause or sleeping. And so called upon to be active. Um, I think you would normally refer to that as a sleeper cell. Yes, in correct. Normal circumstances. You know, so correct. there are yeah, absolutely. I don't think it's any coincidence that Europe are facing, and I don't want to make this uh, my comment to be misunderstood as I'm a, um, a xenophobe or anything like that. Um, I'm not. It's just merely an observation that it seems strikingly strange that Europe is facing an unprecedented um, influx of men between mm -hmm. the, uh, the alleged ages of 16 up to the ages of 40 of single men coming from um, all these countries where they're said to be fleeing persecution in some form or another. Because normally you would expect women and children to be the first people out of the country from war-torn areas, not young fighting men. So it could well be that um, if, if we look, say, for the past years, if you was to go on to, say, a Google search and say terrorist activity, Islamic terrorist activity in Europe, and you'll come up with several pages that have listed terrorist activities, say, for the past 10, 15 years in Europe. Um, yeah. 
how many of them have taken place and the frequency of them um, as more immigration comes into the country. Um, so are some of those sleeper cells with their attacks? Because it's interesting that um, that BBB mentions that because when you look at the attacks that have taken place, for instance, the one that took place in France yesterday, yes, he was known to the French police. Uh, the French police, he was on their radar. Now, how on earth did he get to be on their radar? But what about the guy in Ireland? He was on their radar six months ago. He was caught with a weapon. Then he murders children. Exactly. He murders young children, yes. and he was supposed to be deported twenty years ago. There you go. So for me, when we're using the term sleeper cell, or as BBB mentioned that, mentions, you can see the parallel or almost a parallel between sleeper cell the activity and when the authorities of that country turn say, we had this person on a radar. Yeah. Uh, just tell people about the terrorist attack near the Eiffel Tower. So knife and hammer attack near Eiffel Tower leaves German tourists dead, two others hurt. So, so what this means is we need to ban guns, guys, because if you ban guns, you'll ban crime, right? Because there are no laws against violent crime, right? So because there are no laws against violent crime, what we need to do is we need to ban the weapons that people would use to commit violent crime. So they banned guns in France, but they forgot to ban violent crime. So therefore, the guy took a hammer. Now we need an anti-hammer law and an anti-knife law. What do you think, Thunderous? Uh, are we going to ban cars as well? Because they've been used and lorries that have been used to ram, ram people down on bridges. I think, was it France or was it Belgium or Germany? Germany, that they had, uh, Germany Belgium. Germany, they had the Christmas markets. With, um, a car as well. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> somebody's just put in the chat there, uh, James Dalton, knife spreads butter and Islam. <laughs> that's very witty, I like that. Oh my God, that's I'm actually... Gonna that's. Gonna, I'm going go to go to work and use that word, word tomorrow. <laughs> that's, you know what, we shouldn't be laughing, but that was funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, knife spread butter and Islam, yes. Uh yeah, nice spreads okay. butter and Islam. Yeah, that that is so true. Yeah, sadly, so so this guy was known, and and they were hurt after an attack, man on with a knife and a hammer, uh, as a terrorist attack. And here in Poland, which is homogenous, with one black guy in Warsaw, there's been no terrorist attacks. So yeah, that that is very unfortunate. And do you think that that we need some modesty laws like this? Do you think Europe would benefit from this? Well, I, I, I the, the thing is, you see, when you're importing just men from another country or um, another continent from an environment where women are dressed in such a manner, she, or women are actually kept indoors. Uh, just um, give me a second. Hold uh, on. Um, Peter Foley says Mossad is behind some of these attacks. Frankly, I mean, look. Next, you're going to be saying the CIA is behind all of this as well, right? Can, now, can I address that? Yeah, please do. Yeah, uh, 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 there are there are certainly th th real things in um, the world in history, like false flags, false flag operations, and such. That, that of that, there is no doubt. Um, and do I believe that every every terrorist act that has ever taken place um, been because of Islam? I think there have been some terrorist attacks that have been actioned or sanctioned um, in advance by other authorities or secret organizations in order to create um, a situation to uh, uh, to sort of. Um, I mean, we know the we know the U.S. government has sanctioned certain terrorist attacks. Yes. I mean, this is well known to to further certain policy, but this doesn't mean exactly it was. That. I mean, this but means you've got is, you could have a cell within the government that is corrupt, and there certainly are those. Yeah. You've seen division within the U.S. government, but this also is a way to to make Islam innocent, as if Islam doesn't have any such intentions, because Muslims certainly have those intentions, and Islam specifically mandates these things. 
And, 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 as, and as well, um, I just wanted to add that. I mean, <laughs> there was an illustration once used. I think what the the, um, the comments in the post is talking about is about conspiracy. So let's look at the word conspiracy. And it's a word association game. Conspiracy, you think of the other word, it'd be theory. And I once heard an illustration that goes, um, theoretically, you and I, Lloyd, can go and win the lottery. That's a theoretical mm -hmm. poss um, poss uh, fact. We can mm -hmm. win the lottery. But the, the theory only comes into changes when you buy a ticket. It's, they're no longer uh, um, uh, what lottery theory. It's a lot of lottery uh, possibility. And the more tickets you and I buy for the lottery, then the, probabil uh, the, the possibility then becomes a probability. So as far as conspiracies are concerned, they have to be um, evidence-based. It's only a theory unless you start producing evidence. When you start producing evidence, then it's no longer a theory but a possibility. And the more evidence you provide for it, then the possibility then becomes a probability. And in some instances, there have been situations, um, I think there are very, some big ones that have happened, where it's kind of obvious that um, it wasn't Islam, but Islam was the tool. My counter-argument to all these, even with the um, ones that are possibly um, conspiracies, is that, but you still can go to the Quran and not um, condemn the act. You go to the Quran and you find the justification for the act anyway. So even even if it wasn't Islam that did it and some secret entity did it yeah. in the name of Islam, they still used the manifesto of Islam to carry out the act anyway. It's not as yeah. if, like for instance, if somebody carried out an activity in the name of, um, say, Jesus, like a terrorist activity, we can go to the Bible and say, no, there's nothing in here that justifies the act that you've just carried out. In fact, the Bible and Jesus condemn the act, and there's several passages of scriptures yeah. that we could use. But you can't yeah. do that with Islam, and that's the thing. Oh, yeah. Let me, let me cover something. This is the largest terrorist financing trial that happened in the United States. Right. So money was collected in the US for Hamas. Right. And of course, this money was used, was supposed to be used by the Palestinian state to eliminate Israel through violence, through jihad. And what happened was the FBI found 80 boxes. What? OK, the, sh the short version is there was a man on a bridge, I believe in Brooklyn, I think it could have been the Brooklyn Bridge. A man was seen taking photographs and videos of Brooklyn Bridge, of the support struts. And this was deemed rather suspicious. So the guy was pulled over, right? And they thought this was very, very, very odd. And uh, anyway, the guy was, he wasn't doing anything illegal, but people thought this was weird. This guy is taking photos of the, and video of the struts of the bridge. And anywho, the guy skips the country, disappears real fast. But he's, the FBI is called in and the FBI examines his house, if I remember all correctly. They find a secret basement, a secret room in his house with 80 boxes of documents belonging to the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, Hamas is a wing of the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. So, Thunders, wh why do you think he'd be filming the struts of a bridge? Any ideas? Well, um, I, I don't know. Um, some kind of combination with bridges, explosions, chapati flower. I, uh, I'm clueless there. Mate, it but, could um, be, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm battling to figure this out myself. I mean, bridge struts, maybe explosives plus Islam. I'm, I'm battling here. I'm battling. Maybe someone in the audience can help us out here. Anyway, so they one of the documents they find is a couple of important documents. It's CIA and Elvis. Yes, Elvis. I, I'm pretty. Th yeah, it's Elvis. No, no, Dresden. It's definitely Elvis. I'm, I'm pretty sure. So anyway, they find a thing called the Explanatory Memorandum on the General Strategic Goals of the Group, dated 1991. Amazement at the architectural beauty. Yes, horse. You're right, horse. Of course. Okay. So what happens is they write in these documents ended up in court. Okay, these documents ended up used in court. They were never contested. They were never claimed to be false. Engineering student, nothing to see here. And then the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in America is to destroy America. And they write here, the process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process, right? The Ikhwan, the Brotherhood, must understand that their work in America is a grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. Okay, it is the Muslim's destiny to perform jihad. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of this. Now, then they found what they call the phases of the World Underground Movement Plan, which is the Muslim Brotherhood's plan for destroying the West, starting with America. The five-phase plan for infiltration and an American coup. And the Muslim Brotherhood in 1991, okay, this was found. 
And in 2017, they were recognized as being in phase four of the plan, right? Phase five is a violent coup. Phase one, discreet and secret establishment of elite leadership. This phase has already been implemented in this country. Phase two, a gradual appearance in the public scene and exercising and utilizing public activities. It has greatly succeeded in implementing this stage. It also succeeded in achieving a great deal of its important goals, such as infiltrating various sectors of the government, gaining religious institutions and embracing senior scholars. They mean academia, gaining public support and sympathy. And we see that right now with this whole Palestinian thing and establishing a secret government within the U.S. government. Now, this is phase two. In 2017, six years ago, the Muslim Brotherhood were in phase four. This tells us they have established a secret government within the U.S. government, right? Phase three, utilizing mass media. Phase four, open public confrontation with the government by exercising the political pressure approach. So this would tell me, if anyone was paying attention here, especially Peter Foley, that maybe the U.S. government that did it might be this, this particular Muslim fifth column and your, your Soviet communist socialist woke fifth column in the U.S. government that's doing it. This doesn't mean the nice guy working at the DMV did it. This means that they have seized power and there's a fifth column, a traitorist element within the government that is doing this. Your thoughts, Thunderous? No, I totally agree with that. And uh, I was just thinking when you consider what the initial question was from the beginning was, why do I have the letter V as um, as my avatar, so to speak? Everything that I've read in those two books, um, the fascist, uh, it couldn't happen here, which was the fascist takeover and the science fiction series in itself, which is based on that. And everything you've described there, if you remember the TV series, is mm -hmm. that not what you're just reading out there? Yeah. And it says you're training on the use of weapons domestically and overseas in anticipation of zero hour. It has noticeable activities in this regard. So yeah, understand, Peter, there are some serious, these people are deadly serious and we are fiddling while Rome is burning. Um, can, can I, can I yes? give, an, can I give an Just an one moment. So welcome, Just Janice, Tigger, Dan Simpson, and Christian Malik. Very welcome. Good to see you in the, in the chat. Nice to have you. Thank you. Uh, yes, go on, please, Thunderous. Yeah, I, I, um, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Go on, um, please. Yeah. Uh, just going on a point about um, the media attention. Um, in Ireland, as, as people know, there's um, been the stabbing and there were subsequent riots after the stabbing. Um, but the mm -hmm. media have portrayed the rioters or, I, I, or what, what some of the people would say, the reactioners by the immigration, by the attack of the uh, on, on the children, by obviously this Islamic from Algeria, they've mm -hmm. hardly mentioned the attack on children. They've hardly mentioned the knifing of the woman outside of the school. Yes, they've exactly. They've focused primarily on the reaction of what they've called is far right. Now, the interesting thing is if you read the book, well, it's not even a book, it's a pamphlet called um, The Politics in English Language by H.G. Wells. It, it goes mm -hmm. through like a thesis as to how language is ch evolves and change. Uh, and changes and the more uh, the more decadent society becomes the less language actually means and people don't define the terms when they use it so now you're you're finding in the media people are racist they're fascist they're anti, they're they're um uh, islamophobes and such but they're not defining the terms that they're using they're just using the terms and throwing it out there um to stigmatize the person that's going against the narrative so somebody had put on one of the walls irish lives matter as a reaction to the stabbing of the children uh, by the the, the uh, Muslim Yes, immigrants. and they deem this far right. Yes, exactly that. So they went after, they're going after people, the rioters, and branding them with pejoratives and hardly any mention in the media about the man that did the stabbing. And, and you can imagine the same thing will happen in France as well. They'll play it down as if that the person was on their radar, but he had a mental illness, which is something like a, a little pattern that European media tends to use with the Muslim attacks. So they had a mental illness. There was one, one, one I particularly remember that happened in the subway. I think it might have even been uh, Belgium where some stabbings um, took place. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, what, what someone the, asked, um, Blue Light Moon says, I don't know if mass immigration was planned. Uh, look, I mean, this is not the channel to really 
get into this topic and it's not one that I, but as far as I know from credible research, it was planned. It was intentional. Yeah. It was a political Could, decision that was made in the sixties. Yes. I, I, th oh. I, th I think absolutely agree that um, this mass immigration from these men of these type of, from this particular religion is absolutely bland. There, there's, it depends on your worldview as far as um, the biblical narrative is concerned and how you see certain things in the Bible as being allegorical or as literal. I am a person that sees Adam and Eve as literal, absolutely, and I can argue my case. No. That's okay, dude. I mean, I mean, I know exactly, but uh, that's fine. But, um, but, the, but, but the other thing I want to mention is, is, is that in that Adam and Eve account in the book of Genesis in chapter 3, there's also a third party that's also mentioned, Satan the devil. Now, a lot of people think he's allegorical. I've actually had some Christian denominations turn around and say to me, though, that's a mental illness, like when Jesus was um, exercising demon possession, that was, that was a mental illness, only they didn't have a word for the mental illness, they just called it demon possession. But I don't see it like that. I see it as the demons and Satan are real, and I can quote too many scriptures. I'll quote yeah, it now no, actually, it's like you've actually made, given me a seg segue into something I wanted to talk about. But can I briefly answer a question that came in the chat sure. before we go on? Um, okay, so someone asked, what is fascism? Define fascism. Now, this definition of fascism is technically accurate based on the common understanding. It is a false definition. It is not true by any means. Fascism is a far right. No, fascism is a leftist ideology. It is just a variant of socialism. It's purely a variant of the Marxist ideal of socialism. It has, it's authoritarian, that is correct, because when you go far right, you get libertarians. You get a bunch of guys smoking weed who cannot get together on a single topic. You get, you get hyper-individualism, leave me alone, okay? That, fascism is collectivist. So already, academia, the dictionaries, the entire society has been lying about this because purely it's embarrassing because obviously to Hitler was a national socialist. It's actually in the woods. And I know they will dispute this whole day, every day. Hitler claimed to be a socialist. The Benito Mussolini as the fascist, he was, he was a socialist for decades, for a long time, right? So this was simply his variation. Just like he had the national socialists, the, the, the Germans under Hitler, who were opposed to international socialism, the commun term, the communist international. They were race-based socialist, right? So you had this national socialism versus international socialism. Race-based socialists or racist socialists who were utilizing Darwinism. Someone recently on Kennedy Hall's channel, I did a talk on Kennedy Hall's channel on Wednesday, and um, someone was claiming that I was making up stories about Hitler, and I invited this man to do a public conversation with me on the topic and of course he refused they always seem to do that but notice it promotes extreme nationalism this is very little different to well it's different and yet similar to the national socialism of germany in that it's not race-based but it is nationality based and it often involves the glorification of a strong leader figure so fascist movements emerge now also it is the it's the congruence or the confluence of state and of course industry this happened in Germany as well. I mean, this is not, I'm not going to get into a long song and dance about this here, but this is a leftist socialist movement. Um, let me just do one, a couple more things, uh, Thunderous. Also, I wrote this again recently. I invited Paul Williams of Blogging Theology and MENJ, the Muslim apologist, weeks ago, many, many weeks ago, to have an open, transparent, public discussion on the Sharia. They've both made claims, and Paul Williams put out a video claiming that we have nothing to fear from the Sharia. And I have left several comments, direct comments, and open public statements like this directed to both of them. Menj actually came on my previous one and said, you summoned me, and then failed to respond. Okay, so he saw my post. He commented on the post. I did not ask Christian Malik, please understand, when people say that he will never debate you, that annoys the living daylights out of me. Nowhere, at no time, ever, have I said the word debate. When people say, Lloyd, they won't debate you, why are you saying that? Well, because you've been indoctrinated by Muslims to immediately fall into their particular trap. You have swallowed their Kool-Aid, you've drunk it, and you've been indoctrinated to think in terms of debate. They want you to debate because they can manipulate that debate utilizing their specific method of sophistry called adab al-jadal, right? I'm asking for a discussion. We're going to read the Sharia. We will show it on the screen live to the public. We will read what these laws say, and they can discuss. 
They can tell us what they think. I never asked for a debate, ever, not once. So when, you go, when people go to debate, you are working for the bad guys, okay? You are doing their job for them. You are a liability, not an asset when you do that, and everyone does it, and it annoys the living daylights out of me. Okay, <clears throat> so on this, Menj actually did answer. And he says here, please don't make up stories. I've not received any communication from you and no comments. I left at least four comments for this guy directly to him, which he ignored previously. Okay. And then, of course, <clears throat> he reads this. And this is, not, this is the second time he's responding to me. The first time was weeks ago. You've all seen my comments. You know for a fact that he's responded. I have. He knows this is public. Paul Williams has ignored me. So they refuse to. I want to have this discussion with them. I've also now invited, um, so Paul Williams has ignored me. This guy's run away from me. Um, others have as well. But um, but I've also now invited, what's his face? Um, this guy, uh, B the Bobby's Perspective, ex-Christian. I've invited him as well. So let's see. And then I'll, I'll start inviting others. But I have left an open invitation for an open discussion. Thunderous, your thoughts before I go on too long. <coughs> Uh, it, it comes as a surprise that um, you don't, um, that they uh, th that they would be reluctant to enter a, just a discussion. I think the, what what you just said are about a debate is exactly what Islam is about because it works to their advantage. But mm -hmm. when it comes to the Sharia, the, it, it's very black and white. There's no ambiguity about it. You can't sort of reinterpret it or use the term's context. So there'll be a reluctance on the part of Islam to want to discuss the Sharia because the Sharia is put out in plain understandable um, um, language so yeah. there, there's no room there's no wiggle room in the sharia like they use with the quran and hadith yeah <clears throat> exactly that so so yeah just so we know and then also i want to bring up this um this was very this is very interesting hadith okay um and muslims when i say the words daif bukhari please please learn your religion a little bit spend five minutes studying islam daif bukhari is a joke okay it's called a joke i it's Sahih Bukhari, but when I say Da'if Bukhari, I'm making a joke because Muslims keep saying, no, that's Da'if brother. No, it's not. So, um, <clears throat> Allah's messenger became sick and could not offer his night prayer for two or three nights. Then a lady, the wife of Ab Abu Lahab, came and said, O oh, Muhammad, I think that your Satan has forsaken you. I have not seen him with you for two or three nights. And then Allah revealed by the forenoon and by the night when it darkens your Lord, O oh, Muhammad, has neither forsaken you nor hated you. So Muhammad's Satan wasn't with him for a few nights. Isn't that a little bit odd? Muhammad's Satan. And this is something that I'm working on right now. Um, this is something, you know. Um, Thunderous, did you have anything to add? I, I want to do a few minutes on these, these notes and I want to show people something I'm working on with regards to Islam and the jinn and satanic possession in Islam. Uh, but I'll let you go sure. for a few minutes. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so if you want to go to that previous screen first, because we, we, we had a brief look at that um, before we went live tonight. And um, yeah. so this is a woman. Now, bearing in mind that in Islamic theology, women are only 50% as intelligent as a man. So they share half the intelligence of a man. Okay, that's in Islamic theology. That in itself is a whole discussion when you can consider Khadija. But let's just go with what Muhammad said about women, that they have a, spirit, a deficiency in intellect. Yet she's already able to discern that Satan has forsaken him. That's a, that's a question. That, that raises eyebrows for a woman to be able to do that who's only half as intelligent as a man because no other man in the community has re uh, recognized this or perceived this. Two, she says... I have not seen him with you for two or three nights. So what kind of perception did she have or what kind of manifestation did Satan have with Muhammad that she could see that he wasn't with Muhammad for about two or three nights? This in itself raises too many questions when you consider the intellect of women as far as what Muhammad said they are. Yeah, yeah. So notice they call him the Satan. So now I'm busy working my way through a book that I bought recently. Well, actually I bought it a while ago. And um, uh, this one is called, let me just show you guys this thing. Let me just find it. Um, so this is a book that I'm working through and because I want to do something on Islam. It's called The Crucifix on Mecca's Front Porch. All right, by David Pinot. David Pinot, The Crucifix on Mecca's Front Porch. This is a fascinating book dealing with the Jahiliya. Now, remember, the Jahiliya is 
<clears throat> it is commonly sold to us incorrectly as the period of ignorance, the time before the coming of Muhammad, the period of paganism, the period of ignorance, of the lack of knowledge of Islam, which is odd because apparently Jesus was a Muslim, Abraham was a Muslim, David was a Muslim, Adam was a Muslim, God's a Muslim, whatever the heck, but no one knew about Islam. And the 124,000 prophets, right, Thunderous? <laughs> but no one oh. knew Islam. <laughs> That's a subject in itself we could discuss. Yeah, but this is about the jahiliya. Now, please understand, jahiliya does not mean the period of ignorance. It is the condition of ignorance. Are you not a Muslim? Well, you are ignorant. You are in the jahiliya. Are you a Christian? You're in the jahiliya. Is it 2023? Yes, you're in the jahiliya. Are you not Muslim? You're in the jahiliya. Please understand that. It is the condition. You don't have the gnosis. Please understand that. Okay, and so I'm busy working. I'm actually busy. Um, <laughs> so I'm actually busy using this book. Um, I'm I'm actually transcribing it as I'm reading it. Okay, so as you can see here, I'm busy transcribing as I am reading. So it's um, and I'm making notes as I'm going because I want to talk about. We need to look at the history of Islam, the jahiliya, the period before, the period from the time of Muhammad and prior to that. Welcome, Noah Act. So, repent, welcome, let shed, welcome. They deny the hadith, yes, they deny everything. So, understand, we need to look at what is the pagan environment Muhammad was raised in, and what is the importance of the jinn. We need to look at this from a different perspective than has commonly been discussed on, its, on, 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 on YouTube, on the internet, in academia. And you know that typically I will cover things from a perspective that, that is not common. <clears throat> so, let, let me quickly run through some of this, um, just so you guys can see what, what's coming up in the near future. Now, a prime virtue at the time of Muhammad was asabiya, group solidarity, right? You owed loyalty only to fellow members in the tribe, and morality was group determined. There was no fixed morality. Whatever served the group, whatever served the tribe, whatever served your family, you could cheat, you could, you could mistreat others, you could lie, you could hurt them if your group survived. That is very Darwinist. That is incredibly <laughs> Darwinist. Yes? He just took the words right out of my mouth. As soon as you said that, I thought, well, that's very Darwinian. <laughs> Bro, I knew you'd get it. I knew you'd get it, Thunderous. <laughs> right? So, yeah, that is incredibly Darwinist. That is really utilitarian. That's incredible that these philosophies with here in, in pagan Arabia, there was no central government or police force. And given recurrent competition for scarce resources, violence, vendettas, and a hair trigger readiness to defend the honor of your tribe were prevalent motifs. They took the law into their own hands. Your thoughts on that, Thunderous? <clears throat> well, uh, Muhammad pretty much did, did, did that. And when we consider the, um, the belligerence and the proactive nature of Muslims to defend their religion and their prophet in their community, you get the sense of where they're getting it from. Yeah. So now in the pre-literate society of the Jahiliya, the Sunnah was encoded and transmitted orally from one generation to the next by tribal poets. Jahiliya poetry is well worth reading because the survive and the poem is the poetry is actually really interesting. You learn a great deal and you start to see it in the Quran. You start to see it in the Hadith. You see it in the Sunnah. It is really interesting. You start to realize the mindset, the thinking within this culture. And this poetry are the best and most direct source for appreciating the values, the worldview, and the moral system of pre Islamic Arabia. And of course, the Quran has a lot to say about the Jahiliya. But now notice. Now, true poets were known, and they were often viewed with awe and fear, because they could improvise dozens or even hundreds of verses, and they could also remember, apparently, in honor of heroic warriors. And these verses, recited, memorized, and transmitted orally, secured someone's reputation. This was their means of writing, as it were. But what is important, okay? Notice the afterlife in the Jahiliya was imagined as a cheerless shadow existence, in other words, good and bad, the moral and the immoral, face the same gloomy fate. You went nowhere. This was a nihilistic view. Your thoughts, Anurus? Um This is new to me. I've not read this before. So, um, particularly with reference to the Jahiliya, I, I probably understood the Jahiliya in the traditional sense, not this information that you're bringing to attention. Okay, but no. So, poets were very important to these people. And poets, good poets... People who spoke of prophecy, right, fortune tellers, would be ridden by a demon. They would be possessed by a demon, also known as the jinn. Poets were believed to be paired with spirit helpers. Such spirits were known as jinns. Okay, and jinns played a significant role in the Quran and Mo's life. 
They were nature spirits. They were amoral. They went beyond human categories of good and evil, right? And for those who became poets, right, they were known as Kilab al-Jinn, the dogs of the jinns. Now, isn't it, wasn't Muhammad called something like Kilab something, dog something? Someone just help me out here. And such poets were said to be Majnun, possessed by a jinn. Muhammad, in the Quran itself, is said to be yeah, Majnun. Yeah. Yeah, and, because Allah has um, reaffirmed that he's not, you are not possessed, you are not the possessed poet or the mad poet, yeah. But Allah has to reassure him that he's not. Correct. And I mean, I've seen I've seen Adam Seeker talk about it, I've seen um, Rob Christian talk about it, when Muhammad's real name was, was something about Kilab something, dog something. Now, this reference of the dog is a reference to someone who is, who is possessed by a jinn. So, it might not mean a permanent possession, but yes, Thunderous? It's just the thing, dogs of a jinn. So if they're, if they're referring to the man as a dog to the jinn, you know, I'm just thinking in today's modern society in England, you know, a dog is normally a man's best friend. So is it is it sort of like symbolic of the loyalty of a dog to a jinn in the same way that a man or a possessed poet is loyal to a particular type of jinn that's uh, under that uh, under his spell? Yeah, Kutam. So yeah, I need to think. I need to check with Adam Seeker. I need to contact him and see if he can refresh my memory on that. But kuta means damaged. Okay, I'll have a look into that. Thanks, Inseno, bro. Okay, now, poets used to claim that the satanic demons would cast poetry in their mouths. The demons inspired them, taught them, and helped them with poetry. The poets claimed that every master verse maker had a Satan who spoke poems and placed them on his tongue. And the more defiant, rebellious, and evil a demon was, the better the poet's poems would be. The old poetry may have been good, but that is only because the source was so malevolently evil. And then you have the accusation by the Prophet Muhammad's Meccan neighbors that he himself was a Sha'ir Majnun, a poet possessed by a jinn. And the famous Jahliya poets would give their demons names. One was called Amr. This is a very important word within the Sharia and within Islam, as an example. Your thoughts, Thunderous? <laughs> Well, I'm just thinking, I, I, you mentioned uh, demonic possession quite a lot um, in this uh, and influenced by the demons. I, I was just thinking that at some point, if we could, do, um, when, you, when you've done this, if I could, we could quickly segue into some biblical, biblical scriptures sure. that I think are often not read in connection with the material like you're bringing out now. Uh, yes, certainly. So I'm trying to look up Kilab ibn Murra. Someone just mentioned one of Muhammad's um, ancestors was called Kilab ibn Murra. I'm just having to look to see if I can find anything in my archive on this. So I'm just searching it right now. Oh, but please go ahead. Just go, go ahead, Thunderous. I'll leave it up to you. Yeah, so, um, I mean, you, you've brought out many points about um, demonic possession. Um, and I think in some people's mind, um, particularly even people who look at the biblical narrative, that they don't see demonic possession as being real. And um, as I said, um, I've spoken to some people of certain denominations who believe that demonic possession was just a... Uh, a phrase for mental illness they just didn't know how what how to describe mental illness which is kind of odd because if anybody knew how to describe mental illness jesus would have done yet he too called it demonic possession but let, i would rather let the bible do the talking on this um if we can go to job chapter one i'm just gonna um job, job chapter, chapter one. one let me get that for you yeah um. we're just going to quickly go through these i'm not just i'm not going to be laborious with this sure sure um, and if you go to verse 6, Job chapter 1, and we'll go to verse 6. And it's actually a continuation from verse 6, but, but I just want to just emphasize before it says, so one day the angels came present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roving through the earth, going back and forth on it. When you go through this account, it's a real account. You know, God, Yahweh is speaking to Satan. This is, you know, God's not got a mental illness. He's not suffering from schizophrenia or anything. He's having a literal conversation with a literal spiritual entity. So that's just one scripture we could use. Can we go to Matthew 4.4? 4? And I think Matthew 4.4 4. 4 might be of interest to you because um, Matthew, let me, let, me, let me make sure it is Matthew 4.4. 4. Uh, yeah, Matthew sort from from verse one actually. Should we can we can we bring up Matthew um, chapter four verses one to uh, nine? Matthew four one to nine. So it reads there. 
So this is Jesus after his baptism. He says, um, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, do you remember what we were discussing a couple of weeks ago about questions and uh, such? Remember, notice the same tactic is being employed here by Satan and he's using it with Jesus, not like he did, you know, very much in a similar way he did mm -hmm. with Eve. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered him, it is written that man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city and stood in one of the highest points in the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, um, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, it is also written, do not put your God to the test. Finally, this reminds me again, of this reminds me of those preachers that um, play with snakes on stage and like the one guy that got bitten by a snake and died, they, because yeah. this is this is this exactly the problem. Yeah, and Jesus said to him, "It is also written, do not put your God to the test." So, verse eight again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms um, of the world and their splendor. And verse nine, all this I will give you, he said. If you will bow down, do an act of worship on me. Jesus said to him, uh, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship God alone and serve him alone. So notice there, Jesus is having a conversation with a literal person. But verse 9 is very interesting that people should pay attention to. It says, all this I will give you. So showing Jesus, we don't know how Jesus, um, Satan manifest the, this, um, the, the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. But he's saying to Jesus, I will give you this. If you bow down in an act of worship from me, and notice Jesus's response. That's a really he says, get away from me. He Sorry, does not on. say they are not yours to give. He does not say he does not say you do not possess these things or they're not under your control or influence. You can't give something if you don't own it. You can only give or hand over something that you possess. You can't hand over somebody else's possessions as if it's your own. Now, if you go to uh, one, but John range, 5, hold on. Before you go on, this is this is within the in um, this is in the Serat Razulala, right? So obviously now Satan has the ability to give you all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor, right? Mm. This Allah tells Muhammad, a prophet must slaughter before collecting captives. A slaughtered enemy is driven from the land. Muhammad, you craved the desires of this world, its goods, and the ransom captives would bring. But Allah desires killing them to manifest the religion. So Muhammad desired this world. He craved the desires mm -hmm. of this world. The, the, don't these two align? I mean, your thoughts yeah, on this? Of course. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's a physical <laughs> manifestation of the personality of Satan there, isn't it? And then you pretty much, there, there is the phrase of selling your soul to the devil. Now, in this instance, I don't think Muhammad was sharp enough to have done that. I think it was probably, you know, he was clearly misled by the devil rather than having some kind of knowledge of him and therefore deliberately became subservient to him. But if you go to um, 1 John 5.19. Uh, 1 John 5.19. Yeah. So it says that we know we are the children of God, but the whole world is under the control of the evil one. And um, if we've, and the last scripture will be Revelation. I just need to refresh my brain on which one in Revelation. It's Revelation. Yeah, but this 12. is crazy. I mean, this 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 overlap here within the biographies of yeah. Muhammad and what well, the price that Muhammad pays. Muhammad has to k kill everyone, but he will get the. He will get the benefits or the, the desires of this world. Well, this is what they say about um, the, re, re, Islam is the religion of peace. Well, it is if you wipe out all your enemies. Yeah. What did Tacitus say? We have we've wiped, we've created a desert and called it peace. Yeah. Right. So, yes. um, if we go to Revelation twelve nine, actually, someone says blood sacrifice, and that is actually true. I must admit, because blood sacrifice, just just like just like the whole the whole um, abortion thing, that this is child sacrifice. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's uh, ch child, sacrifice, um, child sacrifice as it was in pagan days where they were throwing their ch firstborn children to their god Molech. And abortion today has an uncanny parallel. It's the same thing, sacrificing children, isn't it? In some way or another. Only it's been grafted yeah. on in a very different way. I mean, and jihad is to kill others for Allah. This is blood sacrifice for Allah. I mean, this is this is crazy. So this this scripture twelve nine the great uh, the great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called devil and Satan who leads the whole world astray he was hurled down to the earth and his and his angels with him so Satan's not on his own there are fallen angels working in unity with Satan in misleading the whole earth. So just going back to um, the question that was raised in the chat earlier about um, uh, immigration whether it's deliberate. If we accept that the scriptures teach that Satan is misleading the entire inhabited earth and he's been doing that, and we, even if you wanted to pick up the earliest point, if not from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, even if you wanted to go to Job as your earliest point in history, I don't, I go from obviously Genesis, you can see that the earth has been consistently up to Jesus, because Jesus doesn't challenge the statement. In fact, if you go to First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, but just give me one second because you're making me think about stuff as well. And I just want to bring up this. Um, this is the Cloward Piven doctrine that people have spoken about. I mean, I wasn't expecting to be talking about uh, geopolitical issues and conspiracy stuff, but the Cloward Piven doctrine is a political strategy developed by sociologist Richard Cloward. And don't forget, sociology is a, is a university discipline created by a socialist, right? This was created by Auguste Comte who was an insane, literally not well in the head, sociologist who created his own religion, a socialist religion to replace Christianity. And he also invented sociology as a science, which was to replace the Christian religion to manage Western society, to manage society in replacement of Christianity. And um, the doctrine suggests that social change can be achieved through overwhelming the government with demands and entitlements to the point where it collapses the system thereby creating an opportunity to bring out the desired social and political reforms. Overwhelming immigration was the tool that was chosen to implement this. Claude and Piven that by organizing and mobilizing mass numbers of people to demand an ever-expanding array of social welfare programs and benefits. Does that sound familiar, Thunderous? LGBTQI drug maps, anybody? Yeah, but also just overwhelming benefits, like Ireland, overwhelming benefits, the yeah. biggest welfare state, the best benefits, uh, Belgium, UK, you know, the Islamic state of Britain. As, uh, oh, the, 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 the countries that these immigrants come from um, have been given the image that the, the roads are paved with gold in um, so and it pretty much works that way because they come, you know, the immig immigrants can come over. They 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 claim benefits. They get pro properties, um, phones, clothes, and things. Yeah. Which, well, 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 that's a separate subject. But yeah, I mean that that's the, that's clearly showing us yeah. what we see today. So this is a real strategy, Claude and Piven. This is the Claude Piven strategy. This is a real thing, and you must understand there were there are actually contracts that were signed. There are, there are international agreements signed with the UN by various countries guaranteeing they would take in people. There they are, I, I can't remember the names of these, but these are legitimate UN agreements that were signed to, to kill them, to countries to kill themselves by just implementing, by, by importing the third world into them. So understand, so th this, is, this, is a, this is a real thing. Okay, this is a genuine thing. Yeah. It says uh, that, that last sentence, uh, according to their theory, this will collapse the existing system. Sorry, my bad. Sorry, Let me just put it back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this uh, collapse of the existing system would create a vacuum that would be filled by the desired radical reforms. And when you consider that the most um, leaders today are very much globalists. So if you look at immigration, um, immigration, they must have known because they have think tanks. Things are not done sort of like spontaneously. There are thinking groups, there are strategies. Um, that governments exercise, they must know at some point what the implication is going to be. And at the very minimum, if people want to go to the nine, late 1960s, in England there was a politician by the name of Enoch Powell who mentioned what's famously known as the rivers yes, of blood. Yes, rivers of blood, and, and he was right. He, and so, so they must. He, if he would have known and he made it public what the, what's going to happen as a product of um, too much immigration, then, the, then how, fa how far back in history does the understanding know that if you start bringing immigration into your own country, it's going to have a, um, a it's going to cause a reaction from the the indigenous population. So, 
this was known. And if there's an end game strategy for the globalists, then it could well be that immigration is the tool that's being used to create the social and and he, and um, schism, fragmentation, like. the destruction, fragmentation, it's and fra yes, exactly, fracturing society um, in order to create this vacuum. And I think it was um, it's what's known as um, the Hegelian di dialectic, where it's problem reaction solution so you create the problem mm -hmm. you that you, you offer you offer a solution you wait for the reaction then you offer the solution so it could yes. well be that we're, what we that what we're seeing here because i don't think it's a coincidence that as a byproduct of all this immigration knowing it's coming from muslim men and i want people to think of this in, in another way as well that when you when you look at the muslim countries that these men are coming from where women tend to be very much hidden in the shadows and the, the, their view of the Western world is that the, the, the streets are paved with gold. But what's the other problem that we have with immigrants when they come over to the country? Well, they're sex starved. And one of the images that they come over with is that is pornography. They see pornography as white women are just up for it. They're gay. They're sex mad. So they come over to Eng uh, England think and, and Europe thinking that this is how white women are, that they are just sex craved and they're just going to have a fantastic time of life shagging. Caucasian women in Europe, but the reality is far different from that because pornography is not a, a, a real reflection of what women's chastity is in the, in um, Europe. Women are very chaste, and they won't. Well, some do, but many as as a whole don't go sleeping around. Um, so th oh. so they come over and they don't get the image that they've had their minds filled with as far as what Europe is going to be like. So that creates its own problems as well. So you find that uh, rape is on the increase, sexual assaults are on the increase, because these men don't know how to behave with the opposite sex because they've not had the exposure in their own culture with the opposite sex because they've not had the interactions. But also right. they've got that image in their mind that white women are just gagging for it, which is also a false uh, image and that's been fed into their minds. So you, if you're importing these men, then they must know that that's the products that you're importing. It's going to create a problem in Europe. All these countries are having problems, and the problems are now getting to the point you can't hide it anymore. The internet is allowing people to see what Islam really is. Now, Islam, Muslims themselves are now having to say, well, actually, okay, fair enough, it's a fair cop. This is what our religion teaches. Now, they're not hiding from it. The media are still trying, are complicit in trying to cover over it. They're branding people who are finding what the text says showing what the Quran says, and now they are the ones being branded as bigots, haters, Islamophobes, xenophobes, far right and such. <laughs> so there must be some kind of strategy to create this vacuum where something is going to come at a later date. And when you consider Gert Wilders has been, uh, is now won an election in the Netherlands, you've got Marie Le Pen in uh, France. I think we spoke a couple of weeks ago about the guy in Belgium and there's also another woman in Italy. You're seeing almost quite deliberately that the, that the indigenous's reaction will be to go far right, as it were, in their political um, um, movements moving forward. It could well be that that's what Europe wanted, a, 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 a far right movement to come in and take control. But you've got to make people want it. You've got to make the people react to it and vote for it to yeah. come in. Yeah, Sweden. I mean, Catherine M is correct. Sweden has has an incredible rape count. They've gone from the safest country in the world, effectively, yeah. to the most dangerous country in Europe. And um, yeah, someone, Bob Katie mentioned the UN Global Compact on Migration. Uh, yes, I would recommend strongly you watch videos on this. There's some very good ones. Uh, Lauren Southern speaks about this, I believe. Um, I would recommend maybe looking at her analysis or find some videos that talk about this. This is a dangerous, dangerous document. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, so the Clawed Piven strategy wants to hasten the fall of capitalism. So destroy the West with the communist utopia. So keep that in mind. They want to force this. Uh, I want to show people something that... Um, Someone made for me, I would need to, uh, oh my golly, what have I just done here? Oh, bugger. Um, sorry, where did it go? Okay, let me do this again. Uh, I want to show everyone something that uh, was made for me. I am hoping to, oh, here it is. There it is. Uh, can I just play this on this? This, <clears throat> I managed to find someone who can make um, some professional shorts for me. I hate video editing. I'm not the very best editor. 
Uh, but let me play this for you guys um, so you can see and tell me what you think of this, please. Um, I just want to play this. This is a, a 40 second long short. Let's have a look at Charles Darwin. He's an arch materialist. And he said, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and horridly cruel works of nature. This is Darwin talking about this chaotic cosmos, right? So he rejects natural laws and purpose, the cosmos in other words. Now, this leads us directly to World War I, which was fought specifically on Darwinistic principles. Germans were going to clean up the filth from the world and therefore improve the world by killing the lower races. And that's exactly what Hitler did. Hitler was a materialist. He states that. And Hitler was a Darwinist. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Yes. So, so in summary, what I'm saying is that is when if if we can accept that the biblical is, the Bible is making it very clear that Satan and the demons are controlling the, the world events as they are happening now, then rather than looking at say conspiracy theories or is it the Freemasons, is it the Bilderberg or some kind of secret society that's controlling things, the reality is we don't need to. Je the, the the Bible, the God of the Bible, Jehovah Yahweh has made it clear to us that it's Satan and the demons that are running the planet. So it's looking at it from their end game point of view that helps us understand what direction the world is going in. Sorry, I forgot I muted if, myself when I played the video. My apologies, everyone. Sorry. Yes, go on, Thunders. So, so did you catch what I was just saying there? I don't yes, know I did. Yeah. Back yeah. yeah, so... Um, so it's, it's looking at it from the biblical point of view, right? So rather than worrying about what secret agency is running the planet, we don't need to. The Bible makes it clear who's running the planet. We just follow along with what 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 is the end game strategy here? Because at the end of the day, at some point, it's all got to be leading somewhere for other uh, further developments of the Bible um, eschatology to be fulfilled. Um, one of those would be um, is it First uh, Thessalonians 5 feet where it talks about peace and security, or Revelation 13, which talks about the mark of the beast. Or we, we could talk about Revelation 17 and 18, it talks about the fall of Babylon and such. There's still much to happen. So all of this is going into a particular direction. So it's looking at it from the biblical point of view rather than try and understand things from a political intrigue point of view. Because if we look at yeah. it from a political intrigue point of view, we're just going to be going around in circles, reading a lot of information. Like yes. Solomon said in uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 12, you read a lot of books, but it's wearisome to the soul. The only book that we need to read is really the Bible. And looking at things like you bring out, you bring out points. Um, in your research of atheism and Islam and such that we can see that reconcile with the Bible to help us understand where we are in a stream of time. Yeah, I mean, that's what I tried to do to really show the parallels and to show the application of these theories and ideas that people have and how immoral they are. Uh, here's a very good question from Dili Gill. And he says, um, do the Muslims ever think what would happen to them if the mainstream media stopped running cover for them? What if the mainstream media stopped running cover for them and started printing the truth about their scriptures? Your thoughts on that? That's a roll. really good question. That, that heads would roll. Uh, let, let's have it right. This is one of the things that um, why people are probably frustrated as to why do the media not say anything about Islam when it's mon monumentally obvious. All you have to do is read the first two or three chapters of the Quran to understand what the manifesto is. The problem is, look at Theo van Gogh. Was it 2007 or 8 Theo van Gogh in the Netherlands was yeah. stabbed or shot to death? Um, look at Salman Rushdie. I mean, this this is something interesting about the Salman. If you wanted to look at a, a, a point in history where that should have told people about the nature of Islam and how underground there is an underground structure. The satanic verses in 1989 should have yes. shown people. That was the wake-up call that people didn't realize. And let, let me well, just go into Talking about the satanic verses, now we're back to this, right? The demons used to cast mm. poetry into their mouths. You know, this is hitting very close at this whole because Muhammad was alive when this was happening. Well, he got some himself. The satanic verses of his own. Of course. Is a lot of that? And if he was being written by a Satan and his neighbor was like, hey, where's your Satan? Didn't say, where's your Allah? Isn't that a little odd? I mean, do, do we have any ideas saying uh, where, 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 where Jesus's neighbor comes up and say, hey, Jesus, where's your demon? I haven't seen your demon in a few days. It's interesting that, um, you know, this Jahililia, that um, even before he became a prophet, Khadija knew everything. 
and took control when you look at the um, the Islamic sources. She knew everything about what was going on. She knew the personality, the name, the personality and the nature of the God or the angel or the spirit that grabbed hold of Muhammad that night that he was um, grabbed hold of in the cave and asked to uh, repeat the words that the angel with the gibberish was giving him. She knew everything when he, her husband came home trembling. How strange that is. Yeah, actually, there's a there's a fantastic. Hold on, I need to find this this claim by Muhammad, his wife. Ah, here it is. Uh, let me, uh, let me actually just. Uh, I will actually show this to the audience in a second. Here we go. Um, this is this is an actual hadith from Al Ghazali. Al Ghazali is regarded as the most highly qualified. Um, scholar of Islam after Muhammad. He's called the Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam. And this is, this is Aisha. Once she angrily said to the Messenger of Allah, it is you who pretend to be a prophet from Allah. And it's in the Ihya Ulum al-Din by al-Ghazali and also in the Mukashifat al-Qulub. So here you go. <laughs> it's, it's in the book, the book of etiquettes of marriage. Yeah, really, but it's, is that it's how legit. Are supposed to speak to her husband? Well, I mean, hey, look, do, do we want to call Aisha a liar? <laughs> well, she, she was only young, so what would Jesus say? Out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, but this is legitimate. This is legit. She actually said this. This is recorded by the highest scholar in Islam. And also, Bobby, the Bobby's perspective, loves. he loves Al-Ghazali. He made a video about Al-Ghazali. And... Um, <laughs> He actually, so he's like, Al-Ghazali is the bomb. Al-Ghazali is amazing. And now just watch, he's going to be not a real Muslim. Didn't she also say that um, your Allah is already re ready or freely willing yeah. to give what you want or the, the desires of your heart? So he seemed to you know these would happen for those spontaneous moments where Muhammad would receive some kind of message and it always worked out to his advantage or benefit. Yeah, Allah rushes to fill his desires. Yeah. So, yeah. so there you go. Um, yeah. So, so thunderous. I'll give you the last few minutes um, to wrap up with with you because I, I don't want to go more than like an hour and a quarter. Um, but yeah, thanks no, no, to the I, audience. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me on again tonight. Thank you for the audience and thank you for some of the questions that you've raised. They are very interesting questions, and you know, that that's hopefully um, you know another in enjoyable show for everyone to listen to. And thank you for Lloyd for having me on again. Yeah, yeah. Are there any last questions we have in this in the chat that we can um, address? Anything that we may have seen? Not that I can see. Okay. Yeah. So, guys, thank you very much. I hope this has been entertaining, but also educational. I hope you've learned something. I hope you found material that you can use and points to discuss, things to raise, and things that you can reference in in apologetics. And um, yeah, Thunderous, last word to you. And, and thank you very much to the audience. We really appreciate it. And guys, also, um, by the way, I, yes, <laughs> my channel has grown. Thank you very much. I'm over 14,000 subs now, but also um, a significant number are not subscribers. So please, if you do like this content, do like, do share, do subscribe. Also, I do not run ads on my channel. I hate those. I absolutely detest those. So I don't run ads. So I don't make any money on the channel from ads at all. So, so really, it depends on your support. Thunderous, over to you. No, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody um, for being loyal and watching the show and for the comments that they make and the questions that they ask. Um, it encourages me to have an opportunity to answer questions and to discuss these things with you, Lloyd. So thank you, too. No, thank you very much. So thanks, guys. We will see you soon. I'm supposed to do a stream tomorrow night. I need to, I think, find, do my final stream on scholasticism and Aquinas and Aristotle and logic. So I hope to finish that tomorrow night the final slide and then I'll do something new on materialism. I'll do my second run on materialism um, called, <laughs> I know that people, atheists love to call it scientific materialism. I'm going to be doing a show called unscientific materialism. We're going to see just how unscientific that is. Uh, Christian Malik, I've heard about you. I know you're an apologist in the UK. So if you'd like to do a stream with me, um, get in touch and, and we'll chat. We'll set something up. Let's have a discussion and see what we can talk about. So Thunderous, yeah. So uh, when do we meet again, Thunderous? Uh, when, when's good for you? Um, at the moment, next Sunday would be um, okay with me. Um, I could do tomorrow night. S um, tomorrow night I have a stream planned, so maybe Sunday? Sunday is fine. So yeah, we'll, we'll uh, yeah. see each other again Sunday next week. Yeah. Any topic in mind? Or we'll just discuss. 
Let's we'll, discuss. We'll, 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 we'll take we'll it as take it take it as it comes. <laughs> okay. Okay then. Bye everybody. God bless everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.